Welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. If you've been listening to the show over the past several months, you would know that this podcast is proudly sponsored by Awaza. You've also heard me talking about the quiet and efficient filters like the BioPlus internal filter and the BioMaster canister filter. What I haven't mentioned yet are their unique aquariums. And by unique, I mean some pretty far off departures from the buck a gallon aquariums that we're all used to. One that I recently set up is the BioOrb Classic. This aquarium takes the fishbowl concept and really gives you something to add as a focal point in your home. I have mine set up on the available matching black stand, and I can't wait to get a certain special fish for this tank. One thing I really appreciate is that the BioOrb is made of acrylic, so it's both super strong and lightweight. Now, if a sphere isn't your thing, that's okay, because Awaza has a variety of other BioOrb aquariums that range from cylinders, squares, and rectangles, all of which have a modern aesthetic. So let's be real. You aren't going to deck out your fish room in BioOrb Classic spheres. It may look super sci-fi and cool, but the reality is you're not going to do that. Now, the BioOrb Classic will provide a great change of pace and something very unique in your home. So check out these aquariums using the links in the show notes. Now, on to the interview. Today's date is Monday, April 8th, 2019. My guest today is Rich Pierce. Rich is a lifelong aquarist with a passion for killifish and kerosens. Rich earned his PhD in biological oceanography, so yeah, he's wicked smart. At home, he has a fish room totaling 80 tanks, most of which are on an auto water change system. Rich is also very active in the organized side of the hobby, currently serving as president of the Tropical Fish Society of Rhode Island, and he's also served as president and vice president of the NEC, chairman of the American Killifish Association, and also helped start SNECA, which stands for the South New England Killifish Association. I'm honored to have such a distinguished aquarist on. So, Rich, welcome to the welcome to the podcast. Hey, Randy. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much for uh, you know taking time out for a relative stranger, and I say relative because you and I uh, we did actually connect at Aquatic Experience this past uh, 2018 in Secaucus, New Jersey, um, and so that was really cool for us to to talk in person. And surprisingly, you remembered me when I reached out to you to see if you'd uh, want to be on the show. So, thanks for remembering me, Rich. Oh, no problem. <laughs> and another fun fact is that, uh, so you and I, we were both in the uh, presentation that Dr. Ashley Emanuel gave on fish nutrition, and she was just on the podcast as uh, as a guest on episode 49. So Ashley and I had a great conversation, and uh, you were present for that talk as well. Yeah, that was a really good talk. I, I learned a lot from her. Yeah, Ashley was awesome. Uh, not only was it you know just incredibly informative, but as people that listen to this podcast know, she was super personable, um, injected a lot of really funny, kind of relevant comedy into her presentation, and I really hope that uh, she is able to get out there as much as she would like to, to kind of spread the word on you know things like fish husbandry practices, uh, fish nutrition, and just kind of bring o- more awareness to the general fish keeping public that you know if your head's not constantly in forums or you're a part of a fish club, uh, you know you can at least get the this information and be a successful aquarist. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely learned a lot, and especially about the nutrition part, a lot of stuff I didn't know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, most of it I didn't know, so I'm just always learning. So that was uh, that's that's what I love about going to these talks is just being immersed in all that information. And so, you know, Rich, I, I gave that laundry list of, and actually, it was a long list, but I really shortened it. I really did an abbreviated bio of you. Um, you have done so much in your time as an aquarist and as, um, you know, somebody that has studied marine life for, for you know, a good, I, I would assume a good portion of your professional career. Um, you know, how did you get your start? Like, if you take me, take me back in the time machine, like, how did you develop this passion for uh, Aquaria? Uh well, actually, I can't remember not having an aquarium. Um, I know by about third grade, we had a fish tank in the house, and it was kind of my job to take care of it. Um, and uh, I pretty much have had fish tanks, except for you know, a couple brief periods ever since then. Um, I, you know, It may have started with a goldfish, like so many of us, uh, but I remember quickly it, it ended up being a 10-gallon tank and a community tank, I remember going down to the, the fish store you know, with my parents and they let me pick out a fish or two. And uh, I was always a, a reader early on, and, and even back then in you know grade school, I was reading TFH. And I don't know, it just I think just aquariums were in my blood. Yeah, do you think 
Now, I guess uh, your parents introducing you guys to, to aquariums in your household, did they have a strong passion for fish or was it something more like kind of the, it was just a sign of the times that, you know, a lot of families just wanted to get that aquarium in their home because it was just kind of this staple fixture? Um, no, neither of my parents really are into fish or, um, you know, anything like that. I mean, my father, you know, he pretty much just worked all the time. Uh, you know, on weekends, you know, we would go to parks or to museums or things like that. I have three brothers, so I think anything to get us out of the house altogether and, and maybe take our attention off something for a while was, uh, you know, probably a benefit. Um, but I just really um, was drawn to the, the natural sciences right from the start, um, I, mean, I remember the first book I remember reading with my mother was one on dinosaurs, and this was back, you know, back a long time ago when, uh, you know, well before Jurassic Park, and we knew so much about dinosaurs, and we thought they were just these uh, lumbering brutes. And uh, so I've always just been drawn to the natural world. Um, and for the longest time, I thought I wanted to be a paleontologist, and then somehow I got into the fish hobby and uh, decided, you know, early on to be a marine biologist. And, of course, you know, watching Jacques Cousteau on TV and, you know, everything like that, just, uh, you know, it was all just fascinating. And New England, we're not that far from the ocean, so, you know, we go to the beach in the summer and I, you know, find strange stuff on the beach and usually bring home stuff that didn't smell too bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm sh yeah, I'm sure, you're, I'm sure your mom and uh, your parents in general really appreciated that aspect. Uh, and, and so I wanted to go back and talk about the uh, the TFH magazine. So one question I have is, is, is way back then, um, was it a dual magazine? Was it freshwater and saltwater, or was it dedicated freshwater? They always covered both. It was primarily um, freshwater. Uh, back then it was the small size magazine, you know, the digest size. Um, I don't remember, like, the first issue I read, but it was around early 70s, so probably around 72, 73. Um, but, yeah, it was it was mostly fresh water. There was a little bit of coverage of salt, but salt was really not that common back then. Um, it wasn't you know, anywhere near what it was, um, you know, what it is now. Um, so I, I would say probably it was mostly fresh water at that point. Gotcha. And in, in our corresponding, you said that you actually still have some of those original magazines that you read, right? Oh, yeah, I, I kept all the magazines, and since then I've acquired a lot more. But, yeah, I had you know, every magazine I probably read dozens of times, um, you know, and then, you know, as I got older, just the collection kept growing and growing. But, yeah, I still have my first uh, first issues that I ever got. Wow, so. that, I mean, that is, that is impressive, because I know, you know, just growing up, there's always those items that... Uh, you cherish and you really want to hold on to, but then as a couple years go by, and I guess maybe this speaks to just your your sheer passion for the hobby. Um, you know, those items you tend to just dispose of them, right? You, you make that, you draw that line in the sand. You say, all right, yeah, this this item does, really doesn't mean that much to me anymore, and you throw it out. Um, and I was just going over this with my wife the other day about, oh man, I think this is this particular item in my possession is like the oldest item that I still have that. And it was only maybe a decade old, right? But for you to yeah. still have magazines that are, you know, what what are we going on? Fifty years now at this point, you know, almost fifty years is is incredible. Uh, well, I've always I've always kind of been a, a pack rat too. So, <laughs> so then, so this may be a total bomb of a of a joke here, but uh, the new Netflix series, the Marie Kondo, where it's all about cleansing your life and you know throwing out things that don't bring you joy. Um, yeah. And you, it, according to her, these would bring you a lot of joy if you've held them on onto them for that long. Well, you certainly do. I, I read her book when it first came out too, and the problem is, you know, yeah, I couldn't throw those away because just just flipping through them. You know, you get drawn into, oh, yeah, I remember that, or, or you know, even you'll see something new. Um, you know, about this time was when the Malawi craze hit. And, um, you know, so you're reading about all these fish when they were coming in brand new. And, you know, of course, they, you know, at that time, you know, I wasn't able to get around and, and go to travel to fish stores and, you know, see these things. So it was all just reading about all these, you know, amazing fish coming out um so yeah it's it's those and and you know books in general just yeah bring me a lot of joy so um 
Yeah, I, I still have a big library, even if she came through here. <laughs> <laughs> Conmari, that's the name that uh, that was that I was drawing a blank on the con the Conmari method. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, that's awesome. No, and I I'm gonna do my best to um you know I've got a, a subscription to Amazonas, I've got a subscription to to TFH, and I'm gonna do my best to hold on to those. Um, now that my my profession is now in the hobby, um, when we actually set up our our offices, um. You know, I've I've already got actually they're they're next to me here at my home office, but I've got some framed guppy posters, flower horn posters. We'll have some aquatic plant posters, but I want to have a very nice uh, bookcase in my office where I have all of these magazines and um, all of these various books on aquariums and, and plants and all of that, so on and so forth, and just have this really great collection in my workspace that I can always kind of reflect on, um, and that I know my wife will appreciate all of that stuff being out of our home bookcase <laughs> and out of her sight, so she'll almost feel like. Like I did declutter, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that um, yeah, I still have. I ended up buying the first book I had was um, was the yellow meta frame version of Exotic Aquarium Fish of the Venus's book, and I just you know maybe a couple of years ago bought a new copy because mine was so dog-eared that it was falling apart. Yeah, and and Joe Ferdenzi, so he he really, um, you know, you know him as well. Um, he really inspired me to hold on to magazines and to, um, you know, kind of amass this this collection of, of uh, aquaria literature, if you will. And that Enos book, um, I've looked at it a couple times on, on eBay for an earlier edition. I almost pulled the trigger on one, um, and I think I'm just going to go back and, and, and pick one up, just pick up one of the older editions. Um, I swear somebody, we had one in our general auction, so our, our larger um, annual auction that we did, uh, but I, I had a time limit and I couldn't stay long enough and they didn't have that particular you know, um, lot of books uh, for auction yet, so I, I couldn't stay around to bid it. Um, I think when I talked to a club member that that I think that box ended up going for like five bucks or something like that, but it had an Enos book and a bunch of other like aquarium related uh, books and magazines in there. So I kind of kicked myself in the butt for not sticking around, but um, I, I know they're available and it's just something that you know it's it's almost a staple that you just need to have in your collection. Yeah, I've got a few different ones, and unless you're going for like a first or second edition, they're they're very affordable. Fish books in general, are, they're not appreciated uh, by a lot of people. So, yeah, they're, they're usually you know, very inexpensive. You can usually pick them up for a few dollars. And uh, same with the magazines. You know, if, if a lot of magazines comes up at a fish auction, you know, if it goes for more than 5 or $10, that, that's just unheard of. So, yeah, if you like books, magazines, you know, there's a lot of chances to get them, and they're, they're really inexpensive and you know, a lot of the information is still good now. I mean, the names might have changed, but, you know, the fish still breed the same way they did back then, so. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that that information, um, you know, it's it, it's not like it's a, a sports article or something, right? It doesn't lose its, its inherent um, value, right, just because a decade goes by. Like, for the most part, that information is going to, it would have been vetted by the editorial staff, right, before they published it, and so it's, it's going to be good, valid content, um, the the marketing material, right? It may not be as relevant. Those products may not be around. But in retrospect, it's always fun to go back and look and see, you know, how what was the marketing style? How did they advertise it? And is that product even around? That should that, that's a great episode. Uh, that's a great idea for an episode. So Corey uh, McElroy and I we went through and went through a current edition and kind of looked at various. Um, advertisements and we didn't call many manufacturers out by name that wasn't my my intent with that section but just to kind of look at the marketing how they're positioning it and what's kind of the truth in advertising and maybe now getting a hold of one of those older editions and going back 30 years and seeing you know how well did that product stand the test of time that sounds like a, a pretty fun idea I don't know <laughs> yeah that is there were some crazy products uh, way back too when it got first started uh, there was one product that it was um, and this was back probably in the, the, the 30s, it basically, you screwed a light bulb into it and hung it on the edge of your aquarium as a heater. Um, on you the, know. Oh, just on the outside? Oh, I assume oh. on the outside. The bulb hung into the tank. The bulb hung into the tank? Wow. I only saw the advertisements only lasted for a month or two. I can't imagine why. <laughs> wow. Was it, did, they, did they position it like killing two birds with one stone, right? Like you, not only do you get your aquarium lighting, but you also get your heat source. Yeah, yeah. It was oh, just a man. thing that clipped in the corner, the back corner, and, you know, you, as long as you kept the water level below the socket, you were supposedly fine. Wow, <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> that's great. So, so on, on, 
I, I guess to look at it from a different perspective, um, you know, what what product do we have available now, right? Like what product is readily available that, you know, when you first started out or, you know, when you were really getting serious into this, you wish you would have had? Like what seems like, oh man, if I would have had this back then. Uh, to me, the, the, the best thing are sponge filters. We had the, um, when we started out, we had the, the corner box filters, the plastic ones. And we had the, the, the charcoal was the big chunks of bone charcoal and glass wool that you had to cut with the scissors, and you know, it wasn't filter floss, and you could actually, you know, it could, pieces could get stuck in your fingers. It was actually made. <laughs> oh wow! And yeah, you that just sat. That was the filter I had for I don't know how long, uh, and it just sat in the corner. And you know, when the wool got all brown, you pulled it out and you you put more in, and you you occasionally dumped out the charcoal, and you know, it. I mean, it did some, but compared to, you know. Like a good sponge filter, not a whole lot, and uh, but yeah, the, the fish still lived, and I mean, and if you go around, a lot of the guys still use the box filters, and maybe not necessarily just as a sole filtration, but for um, you know maybe putting peat in to help soften the water, or putting in some uh, some crushed coral to give it a little buffering capacity. Um, but yeah, that you know just a regular you know one of the modern sponge filters would have been a big a big jump over what we had back then. Um, you know, ne- never mind a canister filter for a bigger tank. Um, the other thing I remember early on was an early hang in the back filter. Actually, the motor actually pushed the water out, and you had to start the, the tubes in the tank were siphon tubes. You had to manually start them, which was a real pain in the ass. Wasn't that uh, called like the Wondermatic or something? Didn't it have a real crazy name? Um, there were there were a few of them, but there, there are some that were air driven, but. I had a couple that were motor driven, and the motor was outside on the bottom, and it, there was a magnet that spun, and there was a magnet inside the plastic box that that spun the impeller. So it wasn't um, it wasn't direct like the power filters now, where the thing just goes in, you know, with the gasket. It actually threw the plastic, so you know, I'm sure that lost some efficiency too. Um, yeah, I, I could probably you know I could probably find them in the old magazines, but um, you know the filtration now is just so much better. It's so it's so easier, so simpler. Um, you know, and and fairly cheap too. It's yeah, been easy. Yeah. When when do you recall sponge filters hitting the market? Like what decade did those land? I don't. I didn't really know about them until after I got involved with the fish clubs. Um, so I don't know how soon they were, but um, they could probably find that somewhere. I don't know how long they've been out there though. I'll bet they're world because the foam you know is a is a more modern type of product yeah no I, I know somebody like a, a previous guest of the show Greg Sage and he's got some fish room tour videos that are up that people can watch and uh, he swears by the box filters and I think his whole thing is you know he want, he likes to be able to see when the filter floss needs to be changed and so for him that, that works but uh, no I could definitely imagine where you know especially in the in the the time of the day when you're you're, you're uh, cutting up the uh, what was it uh, like fiberglass wool or glass wool glass wool wow what other like, what other application was there for in the marketplace for glass wool other than in like a box a box aquarium like what what's its actual function? I have no idea. It was sold as uh, aquarium <laughs> nice filter stuff. Yeah, that's what it was sold for. So I have no idea what else they used it for. Wow, to so, me to me that's just one more reason why every generation previous to mine is just more is just a more rugged generation because I, I've never had to deal with like just being an aquarius like I've never had to like literally cut myself on filter oh well, no I take that back I did slice my finger open cutting uh cutting foam for a matten filter so I should I should uh, I should put a little caveat there I don't remember it being that bad but it was just it was one of the potentials you could end up with you know basically a splinter from the stuff. Oh my goodness! Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds pretty nasty. And, and so, then, how did your experience in the hobby progress? Um, and you, did you have any taste in, in in preference? Like, I guess when you first started fish keeping, you kind of remember having these community tanks. Um, and now we know that you know just from your bio that you do have a passion for killifish. You have a passion for kerosens. Did you ever dabble in like the the tank buster fish, those big big Central American and, and uh, South American cichlids, anything like that? Oh yeah, well, um, probably 
when I was a little older, I somehow I ended up with a, a, a 20 high aquarium, and they did try to keep an Oscar in that for a while. Um, and um, you know, Oscars, they're a lot of fun, but as you know, as I'm sure you know, that's definitely way too small for him. I think he may have ended up back at the fish store. Um, I've kept, um, I don't know, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've kept a lot of different fish. Um, I know I had a Jack Dempsey at one point, again, probably in that same 20. You know, you get them when they're small. Um, but um, I've never had, see, at home, I've never had anything bigger than a 65 breeder, which is I have now. Uh, so that's kind of been my maximum tank. Um, I've worked with a lot bigger fish, but uh, never had them at the home. Yeah, I feel like you guys on the East Coast, just from my travels with work um, to to the East Coast and going into pet shops, that you guys have access to a much wider diversity of tank sizes than we do. Like a 65 breeder, unless that's something that's completely um, out of production, like we are... I, I, we're really beholden here on the West Coast to, you know, short of like the newer nano um, aquascaping tank sizes, like fives, tens, 20 longs, 20 highs, uh, 55s, 29s. I know I went out of order there. Uh, 40 breeders and 75s, right? Like those are the most common sizes. And then when I look at a company like Aquion on their catalog offering, you see 30 breeders and 15s and like every other size that's mixed in there. And I know from traveling, going into those pet stores, I actually, you know, you see these 15s and you see these 30 breeders and it, they're fairly they're fairly common, these, you know, what I would call an oddball size here on the West Coast. And it, it makes me a little jealous that you guys have access to that. Well, it used to be, we used to have a lot more because we had a lot more, you know, independent pet stores. But yeah, I mean, 15s are fairly common. It's, it's actually one of my favorite sizes. Um, you know, it's good for... You can keep a, a small group of, say, smaller cichlids in it. You can keep a big group of tetras, or it's, you know, very spacious for killies, for example. Um, yeah, I'll call my, now I will call myself out on this as a, you know, beggars can't be choosers, but if that if that 15 gallon was available through the, uh, the Petco dollar a gallon sale, my entire fish room would be 15s. Like, that would just be a, a no-brainer. Yeah. But, um, but, but unfor yeah. unfortunately, I'd have to pay like 40 bucks if I wanted to get those things in. Like, And I think 40 might even be on the cheap side to get because you have to special order them. Yeah, usually they pop up at uh, at auctions. You can pick them up fairly inexpensively. Um, I know fairly early on, I, I get to the, was at the point where, you know, there's all someone who, someone has a fish tank and they get tired of it and they hear someone who wants it. And so I ended up with uh, you know a few tanks that way early on. Um you know, it would still be that way, but uh, I'm kind of maxed out with what I am, and uh, I've been I've been prohibited from bringing any more tanks, even if I see them on the side of the road. <laughs> yeah, but you you're at that critical mass though, where you've got so many that if you sneak another one in, well, I guess if if we're talking about outside of the fish room or within the fish room. Well, yeah, it's um, the fish room's full. I, I a couple of tanks outside of the fish room, and when my wife saw that happening. Um, she, she she said, "If I see any more tanks out of the outside of the fish room, I'm leaving you, <laughs> and I'm not taking the kids." Oh <laughs> no! So that that uh, yeah, I, I've been behaved pretty well since then. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, once you uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a critical mass when you start amassing so much stuff for a given hobby that your significant other start starts to lose track of what you yeah. have. But yeah, the, 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 the random fish tank showing up somewhere in the house outside of the fish room is just that <laughs> you're just dead on site. Yeah, so I, I did manage to, to get a 55 and 240 breeders outside the fish room. They're right in front of the doorway. So people come down and they see those and they think that's not really much of a fish room. And then I open the door and you know, that's where all the tanks are. Yeah. And then so, they're like, Oh man, this guy is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> funny you know when the guy comes down to read the water meter or something oh no <laughs> that's funny <laughs> but by by now he probably knows it's it's whenever it's a new guy right yeah yeah and they're like wow do you do you sell fish and like yeah sometimes but mostly just you know to keep them and, and breed them and trade them with people yeah so one of the things that that's just kind of popping in my head and, and i guess the the allure of you know, kerosens and killifish and these smaller fish, when you have a fish room as opposed to like big tank busters, is just the, 
you know, collectoritis, you can really maximize collectoritis, right? Like species per square foot of fish room can just go through the roof when you're focusing on the smaller sp- fish species, right? Oh, that, that's right. Um, especially with Kelly's, I mean, you can, I have a lot of two and a half gallon plastic tanks. You can just, you know, have a whole rack of those on top with a pair of Kelly's in each one. Um, you know, and each one can be different if you want. And then, you know, for a while, I even had a rack set up with some plastic shoe boxes I was using just to raise the, the fry in. So, yeah, you can really get a lot of different species in when you've got small fish. Uh, and, you know, some of them, usually I keep them in species tanks, the, the, even the, uh, the kerosens. But once in a while, you know, you can put two together in a tank, and then you pull out a few to put set up for breeding. So, you know, with a few bigger tanks, you can get... Um, you know, schools of three or four species that get along well and then pull them out to breed. So, and there's, you know, there's always, there's always another fish you see that you want to keep. So with the smaller fish, it does make it easier. Yeah, you know, with, with the Achilles and the Kerasons, I mean, we're really not sacrificing on any aesthetics. I mean, these fish are, you know, they're, they're absolutely gorgeous. I mean, people have heard me say Achilles fish are uh, stunning and beautiful fish time and time again on this show. And, I mean, they, they really are. Yeah, I, I tell people that you know, aren't familiar with them, I tell them they're the orchids of the fish world because they're just crazy colors and fin shapes. Um, but they don't have the personality, if you're looking for that, of like the big tank butts, especially the cichlids. You know, half the, half the killies, maybe you see them, they're hiding in the mops or in the plants and they come out and you might catch a glimpse when they're eating or once in a while they'll, they'll be, the male will be showing off for the female. But they're not... Um, you know, they don't rush to the front of the glass when you walk in begging to be fed. So it depends on what you want, you know, out of the fish. I, you know, I know some people who each fish has a name and, and they have a personality. Um, but I just like the just the, the variety. And like I said, there's always something new out there. You know, there's about a 1,000 species of Achilles, and I've probably kept maybe 100. So i still got a few to check off. Yeah, it's like it's just real life Pokemon for us adults, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, and that that's a fair call on the personality. Um, you know, right now I've got a twenty long with uh, Fundal Upon Checks Gardener Eye that actually came from Joe Ferdenzi. Um and there there's a bit of a story behind those, uh, aside from just, you know, what they're currently doing now. But uh they've they've since spawned and it's kind of, it's gonna be kind of this little community tank going on and it's fairly well planted and they're they're kinda of moderate, right? Like you, you see them a good amount of times, but you know, they'll hide, they will come up to the glass when you, when it's time to feed. Um so in my experience they're kind of like an in between. Um but yeah, I mean with, without a doubt, like they're no uh, Murphy the Mabu Puffer, that's our aquarium co-op mascot that just rushes the glass and follows you around like a puppy dog and, you know, or, or like a big cichlid or an Oscar. Um, you know, you, you certainly don't get that aspect of kind of the wet pet, if you will. Right, yeah, the gardener are usually out. Um, they're usually pretty, uh, not too shy. You know, they'll be out showing off. Um, things like the the Packy Panchecks are usually a bigger, bolder fish. They're usually out. Um but then some of the more beautiful ones, you know, the little diapterons and, and the really colorful ones, they do spend a lot of time hiding. Um, most of the tetras are out most of the time. Uh, you know, there's a few that are, are more shy, but give them a big enough school, they're usually out um, where you can see them. But, yeah, they don't, you know, some of the tetras will come out when you feed and, and you know, they'll come out. But, uh, yeah, they never not like you said a puffer puffers people love puffers because they really have a, a personality and that their face is just so charismatic you know then it looks like they're watching you and thinking and, and you know even even had um you know, puffers or, or cichlids you know they'll learn to spit water at you if you walk by you know to to, to kind of beg for food so they're, they're somewhat trainable even yeah, so I um so during aquatic experience, one of the real funny things is when I when I had talked with you and um you had a, a fellow club member there, and I can't remember if you were rep. I know you were wearing a Sneaka polo, but I'm not sure if you were there representing Sneaka or like the Rhode Island Aquarium Club. Well, I was actually technically I was there for the NEC, um, but we have uh, yeah, we have our Sneaka polos, um, and I. I Probably wore a, a TFS or I shirt one time and probably an, an NEC shirt. Um, you know, it's another thing you collect after a while is different clubs that you're involved with. And um, 
one of the things that you know with Sneak is we we don't take ourselves too seriously. Uh, the guy who did our logo is actually a tattoo artist, and uh, you know, also a fish keeper. So uh, you know, Sneak uh, the, our logo is actually a sneaker with a killifish embroidered on it. Yeah, it's like a it's like a Chuck Taylor with a uh, with a killifish in the in the body of the shoe, which is really cool and. Um, one of the, you know, during our interaction, the, um, you, you, the fellow club member that was with you, the, the gentleman, it was really funny cause I had, I was talking with you guys about, um, just kind of the, the macro shift in the hobby of, um, swinging towards smaller community fish, um, smaller planted tanks, planted aquariums, and what your thoughts were as far as, um, the transition away from those larger cichlids and tank busters and, you know, you had a very, uh, you know, kind of leveled response to it, but your 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 partner was, he's like, good, they've had enough popularity. It's like, you know, it's, he was very, he really didn't care too much that uh, more people are starting to keep smaller tanks and smaller fish. So I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, that was uh, Tony Tessera, who's also uh, another, uh, mostly known as the Killy guy, but he also keeps small things. And he pretty much says, yeah, nothing bigger than about four inches gets into his fish room. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, yeah. And you referenced him in our correspondence. Okay, yeah, yeah very he cool. Was one of the guys that got me heavily involved in Killies. Um, probably about a year after I went to my first fish club meeting, uh, there was a, um, a a Killie convention in October in Albany called the Northeast Weekend, and I didn't really know much about Killies. I I'd, I'd seen a few and kept a few, so I decided to go up there. And uh, I ran into Tony Tissera and a bunch of other uh, Killy guys. It turns out he only lives about half an hour away from me. So he kind of really, you know, got me hooked into Killies and other small fish. And uh, also he's one of the people that really made me look at uh, Kerasons again. You know, when they started out, I was keeping neon tetras and all the little community for glow light tetras. I remember those being big then, head and tail lights. I don't think I've seen those around in a while. Um, you know, those were the common fish that I kept in community tanks and kind of get into, you know, the, the more esoteric stuff. Like I mentioned, the, the Rift Lake cichlids, I kept those for a while. And um, killifish, and then you started seeing these kind of odd little tetras that you don't see that often, and they turn out they're just really fascinating. And they're not hard to find. They just tend to be overlooked by people either keeping cichlids or keeping, uh, uh, you know, garamis or, or, you know, the other common things. But, yeah, small tanks, especially the planted tanks, that's an area that really wasn't, when I got started, there really were very few live plants available. Um, nobody thought of fertilizing with CO2. That was unheard of. Um, the best we had then was, you know, later on, I remember maybe in the 80s was some of the Dutch style, um, but it wasn't until uh, uh, Takashi Amano came along that really showed a different way to keep uh, planted tanks, big or small, and then those small tanks let you kind of focus in on the smaller fish. If you have a 55-gallon tank and you have a half a dozen neon tetras, you really don't notice them too much. You know, you'll see them swimming around, but when you got... Uh, you know, say an eight-gallon tank and ten neon tetras, they become the focus of the tank. And, um, you know, then, and plus the, they set off really well against the plant, the plants and the, you know, the darker backgrounds. Uh, so I, you said, I love all the smaller tanks, um, the smaller plants that are coming in. Um, it's just, there's just so much more now available than we had back in the 70s or 80s even. Yeah, and so I think this this conversation is going to be really relevant. So we just did a, um, you know, we'll put up a weekly unboxing, if you will, and uh, our, our general manager, our store manager, Robert and I, we, we filmed um, a shipment unboxing. And in this shipment, one of the fish that he was really, really excited about um, is one that you had also said that you're you're working with right now, and it's the Protocaridon, um, and I hope I pronounced that right, Protocaridon Pie. Yeah, that's a kind of cool fish. Yeah, and so that one uh, that one just came in, and so for those that don't know this fish, 
Um, if I can remember, I'll throw some, uh, I'll throw a, a little note in the, uh, the show notes and, and find a link to maybe like fishbase.se, which is what I'm looking at right now. Um, but yeah, this is a, a, the body is pretty much translucent and it's called, uh, the, the species name is pie because in what I'm, I'm reading here and feel free to correct me, correct me in this page if it's wrong, but it looks like the swim bladders are turned vertical and elongated. And so with this kind of translucent body, it looks like the pie symbol. Right, right, exactly. And so, um, and so, what have you found? Um, when did you first get this fish, and what have you found? You know, in your experiences working with this so far. Well, the group I have now, I got, I got five. I just, I only had them for maybe two weeks, so I can't really tell you much about them yet. Um, I'd seen them once before, and they, they seem more like a shoaling type fish. They don't really travel together in a tight school, but they kind of hang around in like a loose group. I haven't really noticed um, much interaction yet. Like I said, they're still new and I haven't really watched them a lot. Um, supposedly, from what I read, they may kind of stake out little territories and kind of just, uh, you know, chase each other around. Uh, I'm not sure if I have both sexes yet or not, so I don't know if I'll have a chance to spawn them, but they're just a really unusual fish. Uh, when I had seen them once before, and they had a different uh, genus name, so it sounds like either they're not that common or there's been some recent work on them, but the, the, all of the kerosens, the taxonomy is really not well known and in flux. Uh, but yeah, they're kind of like a glass fish. They have uh, the swim bladder is silvery, and it, 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 you know, if you look at it, it looks like the character pie. Um, it's just one of those fish that you don't see, and you might not even really notice them if you're walking around the fish store first time because, you know, they're with a bunch of other fish. They're certainly not going to pop out at you for the color, but when you look at them, they're really cool. I can probably send you a photo if you want of one. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and the uh, the pie symbol is, you know, it's almost like a, a kind of a metallic, right? Like it's um, it's got a bit of a sheen to it. And you know, to, tr to try to leverage, right, so, you know, you, you've got a, uh, a Bachelor's of Science, you've got a... Uh, a doctoral degree in studying marine animals now to try and leverage your knowledge in the space of freshwater ichthyology what would be some of your thoughts on to why evolutionarily speaking would a fish develop a translucent body well if you're in the water there's a few ways to camouflage yourself but one of the best ways is to look like the water so um, if, if you if you were in the water looking at this fish, you wouldn't see a fish. You'd just see a, kind of like a silver blob and maybe an eye. So uh, it's really a good way to hide and, and disguise your shape. A lot of the um, coloration you see in animals is to break up the outline and the shape so it doesn't look like a prey animal. Even um, you know zebras, for example, you think of, well, how can something that black and white hide? But when they're out in the savannah and there's a bunch of them, it's hard to tell where one starts and other ends. And if you're a predator, you want to approach from behind. You don't want to come on them head on. So it really is confusing for a predator. Same thing with, um, you notice a lot of fish, especially marine fish, they have a, a spot near the tail. And a lot of times the eye will also be in a spot or a stripe. So by hiding the eye and giving a fake eye, a predator might go for to go for the head, or what it thinks is the head, and when the fish um, takes off, you know, hopefully it catches it midsection. But if the tail, if the spot is on the tail, you go for it. The fish goes the direction you don't expect, and you're left holding nothing, or maybe just a, a piece of tail fin. So it's it's just one of the ways that um, a fish can disguise its shape and what it is, and then imagine. The, um, to me, the swim bladder seems very silvery, very shiny. So if there's any light, there's going to be a lot of light bouncing off. You know, in a loose school, all these spots kind of just confusing you what you're looking at. Uh, I guess that's how I would guess why the fish would look like that. No, I mean, it's, it's definitely interesting to kind of theorize as to, you know, why, why a fish uh, from South America in a region where you have, well, let's see, major, major river systems. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, if with this next statement, so if it comes from 
um, in, in anything that's similar to like where the Cardinal Tetra comes from, why one kerosene would develop these vibrant, vibrant blues and reds along its entire body, and then this other guy, for some evolutionary reason, would be like, nah, man, we got to go the direction of being translucent and having some shiny, like some some shiny blindy thing going on, right? Like it just it, it just really makes you wonder, right? Well, yeah, but if you remember that evolution is kind of random, and Anything that's not a detriment will be maintained. So even if there wasn't a specific uh, benefit, like why would the internal organs have what we see, you know, be in two lobes and look like, like the symbol pi? I don't know why that would be other than the fact that it obviously doesn't hurt it to do that. So, you know, if you look at a, a glass catfish, you know, from, from Asia, similar, you know, in the, the translucency, and they do have all their organs you know, kind of in a silvery sack near the head. Um, but it's not, you know, it's just one sack. It doesn't have that indentation that makes it look like the pie. So Indentation like um, going albino, right? Like that that does have a legitimate detriment to them. And you don't see the albinos in the wild because they're, they're so much easier for the predators to pick off, right? Right. You don't see albinos in the wild. But if you look in caves... They very quickly lose all their pigmentation. Um, I just another fish I picked up recently was a group of the blind cave tetras, which they used to be common when I was a kid. And I hadn't seen them in a long time, and um, there's a lot of almost anywhere where there's underwater caves, there's some fish living there, and they very quickly lose all their pigments. So, you know, I mean, normally maybe white isn't a good color for a fish, but when you're not based on your using your eyes, um, it doesn't hurt you anymore. And that saves your energy, you know, as far as, uh, you know, not producing, not spending energy producing the pigments. Uh-huh. And on the blind cave tetras, like, what is your, like, what is Rich's urge to, to, to keep a blind cave tetra? Because I've never had those, and it's just one of those, like, Hmm. You know, one of the things I love about this hobby is it's very much like a to each their own. And there's so many different things that you can go down the rabbit hole on that. Um, I, I think that's a beautiful thing about tropical fish keeping. So I, I would want to understand, like, what was your draw to the like a fish like the blind cave tetra? Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by cave organisms in general, um, just because they're they're so similar to the things we're used to, but just almost like in a parallel dimension. You know, there's cave crayfish that look just like regular crayfish, but they're white and have no eyes. Um, there's cave gobies, um, all kinds of things. So, And most of them are very rare because they're such a restricted environment. So you very rarely get to see, a, a, you know, a, a cave-dwelling form of anything. So, yeah, so cave creatures, they're almost all endangered, and, you know, so they're all protected for good reasons, so, but you very rarely see any of them in the hobby, so to be able to get a hold of a, a cave-dwelling creature and have it is kind of cool to me. Um, plus, you know, you probably run into fish that have lost an eye fighting with other fish or something, and they get along fine. These fish lost have lost both eyes, you know, not to injury, just to evolution, but they can compete with regular fish when it comes to feeding time. Um, they learn their way about the tank. Um, with the lateral line, they can they can tell where the other fish are, and you throw the food in, and they're, they're, they're eating it as quick as any other fish. So it's just amazing to me. You know, it, it, it'd be like having a deep-sea fish in your tank. You know, you know they're out there, and maybe you see pictures of them, but you never get a chance to keep them. So that, to me, is kind of cool. All right, you're you're kind of making me a convert because it sounds like it's the uh, the daredevil Marvel superhero where the the lawyer goes blind right in Hell's Kitchen and he ends up like heightening all of his other senses and becomes like a superhero from it. And so now you're telling me these fish that are blind are like out competing fish that can that have vision. Yeah, it's just surprising that they can. You know, one of the interesting things with the blind cave tetra since it's it's been commercially bred for a long time, so it. It originates in Mexico, and it used to they used to consider it its own species, but they've decided that it's not that far distantly removed from just the Mexican tetra, uh, the Astyanex, I think Mexicanus. So it's the same species, and um, in the aquarium over generations, they will start to get some pigment where the eyes are supposed to be, 
in some of the individuals. So um, it's, it's amazing how quickly that form has evolved and how plastic they still are evolutionarily. Wow. So this seems like a, is Pluto a planet or not kind of scientific discussion? Like, where, where do you, what camp are you in then? Because to me, that seems like, that seems like it should be its own species. Well, it is, but I, I, I don't know if they've actually crossed it with the regular ones, but it's probably still fully fertile with them. And so th there may be areas where um, specimens, you know, get drawn underground, and maybe they add to the population still. There may be some gene flow there. But I think the fact that it can, within a couple of generations, start to get rudimentary eyes back and start getting pigment spots means it hasn't really been separated for all that long. Huh, interesting. What, now, in, in, in those evolutionary terms, when we say not all that long, I mean, that's got to at least be tens of thousands of years, right? Maybe not. Maybe just a couple thousand. Wow. I don't know if you heard recently there was um, on one of the Galapagos Islands, uh, a, I don't know if it was one or a, a small group of finches got blown from the mainland onto the island, and they hybridized with one of the Galapagos finches, and the hybrids only breed amongst themselves, and they basically become their own species in just uh, a couple generations. Oh, wow. Uh, scientists actually saw this because they... They were there, and they documented when these first uh, mainland finches came over and watched this happen. So you're talking maybe in a dozen years, a new species evolved. Oh, wow. Now, what would be... So th this brings me uh, up to a more general question now. If, if somebody listening to this is very curious about the natural world and um, current current happenings of, of discoveries, right, in, in the natural space... Um, where like what would be a good online resource where you're like yeah you should be subscribing to this web page because you know these kinds of articles are coming out all the time like what would be a good source for them um well there's some i'm not sure where i saw this but there's a journal called science which is one of the top journals and they have i think they call it science news which is kind of um they they give you a summary of some of the most interesting discoveries but they're aimed at the general public or the general news. So you'll see them, you may see these stories, and then they link back to the original paper if you want to read it. Um, a lot of them are, are you, know, you have to pay to get them, but sometimes they're not, especially if it's something significant like that. Um, I would say, you know, maybe um, look at that science news. I think that's what it's called. Um, I get some of this stuff for a number of the journals I still keep up with. You can go to and you can subscribe on Twitter to get when you get the index when it comes out, um, or the table of contents when it comes out, when each issue comes out. You can quickly skim through and see if there's um, anything that's of interest to you. And then sometimes the articles are available to the public, sometimes they're not. Uh, but usually if it's something like that, um, you can find out. The other thing would be to go to maybe go to websites of scientists that are working in a fish evolution or biology. Um, there's a few of them out there, um, and a lot of times, you know, they'll write they'll write something for the scientific paper, but then they'll also write something at like the Scientific American or uh, you know that type of level to make it accessible to people. A lot of these these things that happen. Is very technical, but um, the general gist of it is very uh, is very approachable. Um, there's a guy who's working with um, one of the the killifish, one of the cyprinodons, in uh, on some of the islands down in the Caribbean. And on this one particular island, in a relatively short period of time, the species diverged into a couple species. One which uh, feeds on snails, so its mouth is developed to crush snails. Another one is a scale eater, so it's designed to run in and steal scales off the fish. Um, you know, like what's happened in uh, some of the rift lakes, too, you know, there's some scale eaters there, and uh, so... Um, yeah, and, and Ad Connings was talking about the, uh, or he talks about, rather, I should say, the, the scale eaters and how um, just generation over generation, uh, they will, depending on how the prey fish will start to turn, right, like they turn left or they turn right, the mouth yeah. starts to change. 
and yeah. which direction the mouth is positioned to better eat scale. So it's it's absolutely fascinating stuff. Yeah, Amazonas, um, their online newsletter they send out sometimes carries those type of things, so they're a good source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say one of the things that um, I, I think is missing is, is exactly what you're talking about in, in this um, in the space, and what I would like to see more of on YouTube are some of these Smithsonian and university talks, and one of them in particular that I, I just thoroughly enjoyed. It was, um, I believe it's Dr. Uh, Melanie... Stassini? I'll, I'll butcher her last name, but she does a lot of work in the uh, Pool Malebo in the Congo. And so she gave a phenomenal talk at the uh, history of Natural History of Museum about the evolutionary diversity of cichlids um, and maybe other fish, but I think she focused primarily on cichlids um, in that Pool Malebo. And it was it was it was just so such an awesome talk, and I wish that there were more of those kinds of talks because I'm sure they're happening at various universities across the country and across the world. Um, that if somebody just filmed it and we had permission to put those kind of talks up on YouTube, I think I think it would just you know I think there's a a, a yearning for that um, in the hobbyist space. Yeah, Melanie Stastny, um, I saw her. She spoke at um, the Sicktoberfest that was out here. And she talked about the Congo River, and um, she talked about uh, the blind, uh, another, this is, it looks like a cave fish, but the, uh, the cichlid, the, um, the blind and, and white uh, Lamprologus cichlid. Mm -hmm. Yep. So she talked about that. Um, yeah, she, she um, you know, her talk was very understandable, and, uh, you know, there's just so much going on there. You know, the Congo River is amazing. One of the things that, uh, you know, she kind of impressed on us was that the river is runs so fast and so hard that the fish on either bank, the things that are restricted to the, the shallows, are going along their own evolutionary path because they can't survive crossing that river. Mm -hmm. So you're getting evolution on two different sides of a river. Yeah, which, uh, is, which is incredible. And I don't think we... You know, appreciated how easily that can happen. Um, but yeah, they—they they, um, one of the cool things was that they hired or recruited some extreme kayakers, and they outfitted the canoes with some uh, oceanographic equipment to try to help map the bottom because it's so deep and so rough there. Um, so yeah, it was. You know, for them, it's probably one of the the you know a place you're going to kayak where you really can't otherwise get to uh, you know, some parts of that world are not really that safe yet but you know of course she had the permits and, and you know resources to be able to do that so but yeah she's a good you know a very interesting speaker uh, she's been doing a lot of different stuff I know she did um, she did some work on Madagascar too and uh, you know some of my favorite fish are the Achilles of Madagascar the Paki Panchak so yeah, I might just have to uh, to do my best to, to share that particular talk of hers because it's it, it's available for free on YouTube, and you know, see if I can't get that video some more views and 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 let people you know see that presentation that she gave because it's it's just chock full of such such wonderful information, and um, I, I would be willing to bet that there's probably some some silly silly fish videos out there that have 17 times the view count that that you know her presentation on the uh, the evolutionary diversity in the Congo River so I'll see what I can do to get some more love for that video. Yeah, I wasn't even aware of it but I'll have to go look for it now. Yeah, yeah, I think uh so I'll definitely uh, I'll link it to you and uh, maybe 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 I'll put it in the show notes for this one. I don't I don't know if there's like any I doubt there'd be like any copyright stuff because it's for free, and I'll just say, yeah, here's the talk that we referenced, right? I mean, there's no there's no monetary gain from somebody clicking that that YouTube link, so we'll we'll see if I can do that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that was a really really fascinating talk, and um, on the note of uh, you know sticking with the kerosens, that you know that's one of the species that you specialize with. We've talked about the protocaridon pie. Um, you also are working with hyphesobacron, and how would you pronounce that? Which one, the Wadi or, uh, or or just the the genus name? Did I did I butcher it or Hyphesobricon? Hyphesobricon too. Hyphesobricon. Okay, so the the Wadi and the Paranga. So between those two that you're working with, which one would be your? Uh, which one are you liking more right now? Uh, well, I've had the the Wadi for a lot longer, um, so they're kind of you know a, a, a long time favorite of mine in the fish room. Um, 
the Parangi are, are kind of cooler right now because they're newer. They're a little smaller, but both of them get really colorful. They get uh, they get a lot of red over the whole body. Um, I've, I've had some small success breeding them, but haven't really gotten large numbers out of them yet. Mm-hmm. And wh- think- what's your what's your technique that you're working on right now to for breeding? For a lot of them, well, I mentioned I keep a lot of them in um, species tanks, so I'll just have it full of full of plant work, especially a lot of Java moss, a lot of uh, foster tang, the the pelia, things like that, and a lot of times fry will just appear and grow up in the tank. So you can keep, a, you know, if you give them a, a spacious tank, they'll get to be like a number that they seem to be comfortable with and they generally maintain that number. I have some um, of uh, um, the, the, the rainbow tetra, the nematobricon lacordi that I have in, I think it's a 30 high, and there's always, you know, a dozen adults and, you know, maybe another half a dozen to a dozen young in the tank. Um, so, you know, if I need, if I want to give some to someone, I can scoop out some or, you know, bring a few to an auction and then they'll replace themselves over the next few months. Oh, that's, that's very interesting that they have a self-regulating mechanism kind of just in the, you know, I don't want to call it the easy mode aquarium, but, you know, in, in the, you're not pulling eggs or anything like that, that they'll reproduce to a certain kind of population limit. What I think happens is with the um, the older siblings eat the younger ones as they're growing up, so it kind of limits the numbers. And I think as they get more, there's more eyes and mouths looking for eggs. And so I don't know if it's uh, you know kind of purposeful regulation or just that there's less space for the little ones to hide. Uh, but if you, you know if you pull out young when you see them, you can get more that way too. Uh, but it's just it is an easy way because. It's you really just you do the water changes, you know, a couple times a year. I'll pull out the sponge filter and, and you know rinse out the grunge from it, and then just uh, you know feed them well. And there's not a lot of other work. You know, scrape the algae off the glass so you can see them. <laughs> Which and that's that's the optional work, right? <laughs> that's the optional work. Usually, that, usually that that. That really gets done when you know right before someone's gonna come visit. Yeah, no, no, I've said that. I've said that before. I had uh, uh, Sherry who is starting up the uh, her and a couple others are starting up the Pennsylvania Guppy Club, and yeah. we were talking about like one of the best things about inviting somebody to your home to your fish room is that it forces you to clean your aquariums and it forces you to clean that glass and straighten things up and you know put away all the extra food containers that you don't need to have out. Yeah, I've got one tank right now where. The only reason I know there's something in it is it's up high, and I can see fish reflected off the surface. But <laughs> that's great. Got, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, an, an odds and ends tank. So I know there's some fish in there, but they're they're older fish. They're kind of you know just like out to pasture, but they're still nice fish. And I should just you know get up there on the step ladder and clean the glass. But <laughs> like I said, usually when someone's coming over. That's when you really go through and clean up and make sure everything's presentable and make sure all the the tanks are topped off and, you know, all the lights are working, stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What's what's this dark tank over here? Oh, um... That's really cool. Here, yeah. let me scrape off the glass. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's it's so sad right now. I've got one tank that is just um, just nothing but green water in it, and it's uh, probably a, a pair of... Um, black and blue periaba um and i'm probably butchering that name wrong because i've only ever seen it i actually haven't heard anybody say it out loud um but angelfish though so a male female and they're just like completely in green water you know happy as can be and you know just fattening up just nice but i need to address that green water so i can actually look at them and appreciate them i found that the best way to get green water to get rid of green water is to try to culture daphnia yes if you eat it you'll lose it all Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and I've actually, um, I, I had a, a Daphnia culture going, and people that listen to this show regularly are probably like, oh, it sounds like Randy lost his Daphnia culture, and I and I did. I got kind of lazy and, and stopped feeding them, but um, I think the ones that I put outside in, in my pond and a couple of the, the outdoor tanks that I have, I think I think that that might be doing all right, so I'll have to go check on that and maybe pull some from outside and, and uh, help knock down this green water. So, yeah, no, it's... I've just found as soon as you need a supply of it, it'll, it'll clear up. 
<laughs> that's like that's just a rule of life, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know Murphy's Law for the fish room. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so let's uh, so Rich, let's talk about like clearly if people haven't picked up on the fact that you are knowledgeable and you've been doing this for a long time and you've got a lot of experience, uh, let's talk about Rich's Fish Room dot com. So that's a new a new project of mine. Um, I just um, there's a lot of stuff I like, uh, and I just kind of get it all in one place. Uh, one of the things getting involved with the fish clubs is every fish club gets a website, and then you know, the webmaster is all volu- is a volunteer, and then the webmaster will leave, and no one knows how to maintain the the site. So, like, where do you find the stuff that you used to find there? So I kind of just started this as a place to have our club stuff, um, stuff I like, links to places I like. Uh, I do a lot of fish photography. It's another thing I learned from Tony Tessera. Um, so I have a link to a site where I can put my photos up. And then um, maybe a year and a half ago, I got I, I found this online site called Quora where people ask just questions and other people answer it. And I started answering, you know, fish questions for people. And, um, you know, they're, they're some of them are maybe not quite long enough to be a full article for a newsletter, but I put the best ones there on so people can see them. Um, There's a lot of information out on the Internet. There's a lot of kind of misinformation and half information out there. So these are kind of, I mean, I'm not necessarily the authority, but these are from my experience, you know, my opinions or how I've kept fish or even get into some of the scientific things. Like I talk about... uh, uh, in Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, there's a blind fish. How can that happen? Um, one of the things I put up is, I, I'll probably put up soon, someone asked, I've seen all kinds of recommendations on what size tank or bowl to keep a betta, and what's their answer? And, you know, there's people out there that will, will they'll argue, they'll tell you, you know, if you keep a betta in less than a 5 or 10-gallon tank, you're evil and you're doing something wrong. And I just go, so, well, it depends on how often you're willing to do water changes. And, you know, there's a lot of things that go into it. There's not really an answer. It's, well, what do you what do you want? You know, do you only have room for a two-gallon bowl on your desk? Well, if it's warm, you can do it. And you can, you know, give the bed a quality life. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, a 10-gallon tank minimum. So things like that, things that, you know, maybe you're not going to come across, but Kind of like things you might get if you were talking to someone at a at a fish fish meeting or something. Yeah, and actually, I read the. Um, I didn't realize this was this one was a, a Cora question, but the how did my fish survive in a planted tank after a month without getting fed? And you have a fairly lengthy response to it. And so I read that one, and um, you know, really cool. You even dropped the German word uh, off sh- on them. Off, yep. off. I don't even know how to pronounce that one, but it's the it's the it's the fish that feed on. Um, kind of the the mulmy algae, uh, which sometimes contains little uh, like little critters in it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's basically all the biofilm that grows on everything that's under the water, and you know it'll typically have infusoria living around it, which is another good German word German word for uh, the little protozoa that you know kind of all the little barely see you know you can just like barely see a speck moving or microscopic. Um, but yeah, people, you know, a lot of people, especially if they're beginners, you know, they worry about going away for a weekend and who's going to feed the fish. And I try to tell people, you know, don't don't have someone come in, you know, don't get one of those feeding blocks. If the, if everything's good, if the fish are healthy, you can leave them for a week long vacation and they'll just be fine when you come back. And you probably had that that experience where, you know, maybe for some reason you forgot a tank for a while and you didn't think there were fish in there, and you go to clean it out, and you find the fish in there are perfectly fine, and since you weren't paying attention to them and half the water evaporated, they probably spawned. <laughs> and you know, probably a fish you've been trying to spawn for a long time and can never happen, and then when you ignore them and stop feeding them, they decide, hey, hey, we're being left alone. Let's let's, let's get busy. So. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I've, I've definitely found fish. I've never found fish that have bred, though, but I, it does not it does not surprise me the... the um, you know, kind of the awesome mystery that is that is a fish. Well, it happens with Achilles a lot. You'll you'll have a 
you know, a tank, and a lot of people will keep killies in the heavily planted tank, too, and just scoop fry out. And I can't tell you how many times guys have told me that, yeah, I had the fish for a year, they haven't done anything, so I decided to, to get rid of them, and I was just breaking down the tank. I found a dozen fry in the tank. <laughs> you know, they've been breeding all along, and the fry have just been hiding, and as soon as they get big enough to be seen, the adults eat them. And, but, you know, and, and amazingly, I found that a lot of fish, if you raise them in the community tank, they go faster and better than when you pull them out and raise them in their own tank, and then you're worried about cleanliness and getting enough food. You know, if you're just raising a few fish that to grow up with the adults, they grow up pretty quickly and usually a lot more colorful than when you you know, pull them out in a, a grow out tank. Mm-hmm. No, that's good. That's good insight. And so, uh, also on your website, you've got uh, the talks that you give and why this is really relevant. And, and people that listen to this know that. Uh, so, past guests like. Um, Eric Lucas and Greg, uh, Greg Steves. Greg's actually going to come up this summer to talk at the uh, Greater Seattle Aquarium Society. But uh, I work with the, you know, kind of uh, provide my input to our speaker chair. And we're always looking for, you know, good speakers to bring to the club. And, you know, you are without a doubt somebody that I'm going to send over to Kathy and say, hey, we need to get rich into, into Seattle and, uh, and show them what our club's all about. And so your talks that you have listed here, it's, it's pretty extensive. So I'm just going to read the titles. I'm not going to go into the, uh, the one or two sentence descriptions, but I think it'll give the listeners a, a pretty good flavor of, you know, the, the breadth of which you can speak on. And so it's uh, Introduction to Killifish, Chromo Aphasimian, Fundal of pan checks, lamp eyes. Um, you've got one titled "It Rains Fishes." Um, so I guess I should read the description on that one. That's all about South American annual killifish. A second look at tetras, which we've kind of gone through in this episode, right? Of, of talking about some of these carrots and species. Um, fishes of Madagascar, Pocilliids of the Car- of the Caribbean, seahorses, pipefish, and sea dragons. Although that's saltwater, so we don't. We're a freshwater show here. <laughs> <laughs> Taking good fish photos with any camera. Uh, fish I would keep if I had a time machine. That sounds really cool. Uh, the golden age of the aquarium hobby. So I love I love the history aspect of the hobby. Uh, mollusks in the aquarium. Building an automatic flow through water chain system, which very, very important. And I probably wish I would have listened to that as I was building mine out. And then fishy jeopardy, which sounds really cool. So that one, your club forms teams and competes to see who knows the most about fish, the aquarium hobby, and other fishy trivia. That would be sweet to do that at our club. I've done that at a couple of clubs, and people are usually kind of, they're not quite sure about it when they start, but, you know, there's a lot of humor in it, and um, we do it do it team style, you know, because I don't have, you know, nobody wants to watch a bunch of other people, and people end up usually laughing a lot, and, and you know, some of the categories I have are, you know, cartoon fish or, you know, talk about advertising in the past, and it's just that, you know, it's not to try to stump people. It's try to kind of force you to think. And, I mean, there is a little bit, you know, I'll have a category where I show you a picture and, and you got to tell me the name of the fish. And you get points if you know the scientific name. But, you know, it's just, to me, I just found people seem to like it. It, it um, you know, it's just a good way also, the way I do it is I kind of randomly form the team. So if the, if the, club has like say clicks it forces people to to kind of interact with people they may not you know normally interact with yeah yeah no that's that's good stuff and i you know clicks aside i think and i've kind of called this out as well is that we have this you know you show up to the fish club meeting and you kind of sit down and you just wait for the you wait for the speakers and the uh, the the announcements to start and it, I don't know, maybe it's because we're inherently a little introverted in the hobby. And, and I don't mean that in any bad way, but, you know, we, we like fish in, in our in our houses and, you know, that's just kind of our thing. Um, and maybe we're not always the most outgoing people. So something like this, you know, kind of pushes you into being more interactive with your club. And, hey, you may end up talking to a club member that you've never talked to before and you guys keep the same fish. And, you know, it's it's like we all come and we get the same information from the speaker. So we have that shared experience and then we all bid on items at the auction. But it, we don't interact with each other nearly as frequently as I think we should. Maybe that's unique to my club and one of the challenges that we need to overcome um, in in a more established club where... Um, you know, you have really good speakers, so you draw people in, but there isn't that mechanism to get people to engage with each other. That's Well, that's always tough. Uh, we do try to have, well, we do have for our club, we do have a Christmas party uh, where we do a few, like we, we'll play musical chairs or we have hot potato and uh, 
we do a Yankee swap. Um, and then um, usually once or twice a year we'll have just like a social night where we'll get pizza and, you know, and maybe just um, you know, people will chat. Because there's one of the kind of the cool things about getting in the fish clubs is you meet people you would not normally ordinary meet, ordinarily otherwise meet. Um, one of the guys in, um, in one of the top breeders in our club is a retired elementary school principal. And, you know, other than when my kids were little, the odds of me interacting with an elementary school principal are almost nil. Um, there's another guy who's a master carpenter, a couple of truck drivers, a fireman, uh, you know, just all kinds of people. And they all, you all have something in common with them, but you might find out other things too from it. Yeah, and, and, and to be real, nobody else in our lives wants to hear about our fish. I mean, you have to you have to use your fish club as your outlet to talk about your you know exciting new species and what you picked up at the fish store, and you know because because <laughs> for the most part, like your spouse is, your spouse doesn't want to hear about it. Your your friends from high school don't want to hear about it. Like yeah, unless you've converted them to be fish nerds. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and my wife will come down to the fish room maybe twice a year. <laughs> One of those times is because she's looking for me. Once in a while, she'll come down and look, and I'll you know point out the prettier fish or tell her why this fish is cool. But you know, it's it's not one of the things that we do together. We have other things we do together. But yeah, I mean, most of the people in your social circle, unless you've just become a total fish geek, you know, aren't into fish. And you know that that's probably good too that you're not 100% in the fish world. That you you know come up for air once in a while. Yeah, you say that as I just took a uh, a career turn into to be 100% in the fish hobby. So, yeah, I do need to come up for every <laughs> once in a while. Well, as long as you do it on your terms, you know, fine. You know, retired from a few of the things I was doing because I was getting, spending more time, you know, running clubs and not enough time taking care of fish. So I'm kind of getting back into the fish a little bit. Yeah, we haven't we haven't even talked about that, but I mean, just to just to go back over and gloss over it, that you've been a president of a couple clubs, and you know, you've been very very active, and that that I know just from the the small participation that I've had, um, you know, on a fish club board as a committee chairperson, that um, you know, it's it's just one more you know, responsibility in your life that is a volunteer activity, and it's you know, it's just something that takes time, and um, you know, it doesn't, it's not easy, right? It's not easy. And especially the the hardest thing is learning to kind of say no once in a while because, you know, every fish club that I've seen, it's usually about half a dozen people that do most of the work. And a lot of people, there's a lot of other members that will help out a little bit, but there's about half a dozen people that really keep it going. And, you know, sometimes, you know, the guy who's your treasurer maybe has to go take care of his parents for a while, so you're like, well, I can do this for a little while, and then it ends up a year or two, and, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, we need to work better at as a club is getting new people in and kind of uh, nurturing them to get them into, you know, to kind of leadership roles, and it's something that just kind of, you know, in my experience, it usually either happens organically or doesn't happen, um, so that's kind of one thing we try to work on is, you know, someone new comes to the club, we try to welcome them, you know, tell them, you know, they don't need to join, for example, anyone's welcome to come to the club, uh, you, know, you know, you never have to, to join if you don't want to, uh, you know, there's some advantage to joining, like you get to participate in the BAP program, but, you know, we're happy to have visitors, but, you know, the first time I showed up at the Rhode Island Club, a couple guys, long-time, you know, members came up and recognized I was new, welcomed me in, you know, told me how things work, and then, uh, you know, so it's, it's really nice to be welcomed. You know, you're not walking in, it's like, well, I'm just going to sit in the back and, you know, see what happens, but, you know, have people come up and they actually seem happy to see you. Yeah, no, definitely. Those are all those are all really, really good things. And, you know, to, to my club's credit, I have seen some of the board members actually do that where they'll notice somebody new and uh, go up and introduce themselves. And um, but, yeah, I mean, just just beyond that initial, you know, greeting of, of welcoming, um, you know, what's what is that? What is that engagement point or what's that engagement mechanism to make sure that uh, 
that, that people are having a good time. And I think I definitely think something like a fishy Jeopardy would be awesome. And I'm sure Nick from uh, North Sound Aquarium Society, he's listening to this. And so I would love if you came out to Seattle, you should do like a dual uh, a dual visit where you also uh, get a chance to go hang out with those guys because they we, they meet on the weekends. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm not able to, to attend those. But they actually have their club meetings at <clears throat> a pretty popular uh, kind of gastro pub. And uh, yep. so it's a brewery with, you know, really good food. And uh, I've joked before that it's, you know, they push a couple tables together and, you know, they're talking about fish and what they have and everybody else around them in the general population is looking at them like, what the heck are these guys talking about? Like, if you were to play Fishy Jeopardy with these guys in that brewery, it would take the stairs to the next level. Like, <laughs> that would just be so awesome to see. Well, if you're going to fly me out there, I might as well do a couple of different things. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, I, I do enjoy going around to other clubs, meeting, you know, other people, uh, maybe getting a tour of a fish room or a good fish st- store in the area. Yeah, um, yeah, the uh, the little store, the uh, the aquarium co-op based uh, just north of Seattle. I'd be more than happy to uh, to to take you around the store, show you our operations, and, and uh, let you feed Murphy the Mabu Puff or some, uh, some clams on the half shell. Oh, sure, that'd be fun. All right, Rich. We'll definitely be staying in touch on the um, on getting you out here. Um, I'm. I think we might be. I, I definitely think we're looking for twenty uh, for twenty twenty for sure. Uh, maybe even back half of this year. But we'll definitely stay in touch. Um, and I have had an absolute blast talking with you, sir. And you know, we there's been a there's been some interruptions from my toddler son who learned how to break into the office apparently. But uh, you've been an absolute trooper of an interview uh, of an interviewee. So I really appreciate that. Well, well, thanks for having me on. It's been a lot of fun. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the thing I like going to conventions is, you know, the hospitality hour after all the, you know, things have wrapped up, we just kind of sit around and, you know, talk with other fish nuts and you know, <laughs> compare experiences. And, you know, to me, that's like the most, you know, fun part of the convention. You know, seeing the talks is always good because you learn new stuff, but, you know, then being able to hang out and just kind of, go wherever the conversation goes it's just a lot of fun hey that, that means a lot to me if a, if a uh, you know a relative newbie um aquarist is able to to hold your attention and have a good conversation for close to an hour rich i mean that's uh that you know i'll wear that with pride oh well good yeah i mean you've got the interest and the passion for it so yeah i mean just everyone even people starting out you know i've had people start out in the killy hobby that they're told that these are really difficult and I'll say, well, give them a try because if you really like them, you'll you'll figure it out. And you know, have had people that have just started out get very successful with the supposedly hard fish. So there's not really the fish really don't care how much experience you have as long as you give them their water changes and feed them what they like. They're happy. Yep, yep, definitely. All right, Rich. Well, thank you very much. I mean, you are three hours ahead of me, so we are well into the uh, the evening over on the East Coast. So I really appreciate it, and thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me.